we make these devices called microfluidic devices that are kind of like, you know, you can sort of picture the way integrated circuits made it possible to do a lot of electronic computations in a very small footprint. And that kind of led to this revolution in computer science uh, hardware. Uh, we make these microfluidic devices that allow us to do like fluidic computations in high throughput in very small footprints. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Polly is an assistant professor of genetics and bioengineering at Stanford. Her lab's main focus is on developing and applying new microfluidic platforms to create high throughput data, which is crucial to making machine learning work in biology and genetics. I'm super excited to talk to her today. Thank you so much for agreeing to this interview. People have been asking us to, to get more kind of content on the intersection of biology and machine learning. And it's kind of funny, I'll just say, you know, I, I kind of, you, you told me that you didn't know anything about machine learning, but as we've kind of gone around, we've realized that you're, you're well-respected as someone in biology that <laughs> knows a lot about machine learning. So I don't know if I can trust your own uh, self-assessment here, but. That's really, yeah, that's really nice to hear. I feel like we don't, we don't know very, we don't know very much about machine learning, but we have been collaborating more and more with experts in machine learning. So we're, we're trying to learn as we go. Well, it's funny, you know, I, I've discovered kind of with our, you know, with our pharma customers and we've gotten a lot of those lately, I, I started to realize like dropping your name actually gives me like a ton of street cred. So I've been, uh... <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's really, that's great to hear. Yeah. And awesome. I, I guess I should say, you know, I feel like, you know, I, I was friends with you from, from undergrad. So it's a, a little funny. I mean, it's awesome to watch your career trajectory and uh, it's exciting to oh, say, to you know, talk same, about your work. <laughs> same on my part, right? If I tell, you know, if I tell any of my students that I know you instantly, it's like I'm a Silicon Valley celebrity, right? So it's, <laughs> you know, I'm like at least in close proximity to it. So it goes both ways. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, maybe you could explain, you know, kind of at a high level what your um, research interests are. You kind of laid it out in the notes. And I, I tried to do some background research, like reading your papers, like I normally do with the machine learning guests. But I found, you know, your, your academic work pretty impenetrable. So <laughs> yeah. I think you just take a big step back with me and, and sort of explain what you're doing and, and why it's important. Yeah, it's really technical. So I guess I would say a couple examples of the things that I'm interested in are you know, the promise of the Human Genome Project a long time ago was this idea that we were going to be able to sequence everybody's genomes. And then we would look at the difference in the sequences of those genomes, and we would instantly be able to say whether a particular mutation in the genome meant that somebody was going to have a particular disease, or maybe they would respond to a particular treatment. And I think the challenge is that the amount of possible variation is really huge. So there, there are so many different variants that we discover, and we still don't really know for the vast majority of variants, three quarters of variants that we found, we have no idea whether they're likely to have a functional effect. I'm and sorry, so I'm just starting the dumb questions yeah. early. So yeah. you, you mean variants of genes, like different DNA, is that right? Yeah, I mean like different letters right. in the genome, different letters in the genome, right? Different so, letters in um, the DNA. Okay, got it. got it. Yeah, different letters in the DNA. And so like probably the main thing that my lab is really interested in is trying to figure out, you know, maybe from high school biology, everybody kind of remembers that DNA makes RNA, makes protein. And we're pretty good for portions of the genome, the parts of the genome that say what proteins to make we have a pretty good sense of what RNAs are made and what proteins they make kind of. But then what we really don't know is how to predict what those proteins do from the sequence, right? So it's like we have parts of the, of the program, but we just mm -hmm. don't really know how to predict what the functional effects are gonna be when we make changes. Right, so it's, I mean, isn't it like kind of deterministic? Like, don't you actually know from the DNA what RNA might make, or I guess in biology, yeah. anywhere you pull out a thread, it gets it's more complicated than you think, right? Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty interesting in that we have a sense of I guess I would say so we know for the parts of the genome that actually code for proteins, which is a tiny amount of the genome, like a really small fraction, we have a sense of what RNAs are made, but mm -hmm. there's way more regulation after that. So first just for the RNA, the RNA kind of will loop around and cut itself up to, to make kind of different variants. 
Mm-hmm. And then when we make proteins from that, you know, I think one of the big challenges is figuring out a protein is like a linear sequence that mm-hmm. has to fold into a three-dimensional structure. Mm-hmm. And that three-dimensional structure does something. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, a great example of where machine learning has had a real impact in biology is, you know, AlphaFold2 mm-hmm. is a great example where there's been this problem for a long time what three-dimensional structure do linear protein sequences make? And Mm -hmm. here, machine learning algorithms have improved our ability to predict that, but we still don't know what those proteins do when they're Mm -hmm. folded or whether they just fold into one conformation or multiple conformations. So I think there's a lot more questions like that. Could you give Uh, me an example of like one that you you do know? Because we know some, right? Like there's some mechanisms that we understand, right? Yeah, I mean, there's some... There's some, like, in terms of protein folding or... In I guess just in terms of the whole sequence. So, like, you have a different... Like, what's what's the sort of, like, canonical example from, like, high school biology of, like, you have some different letters, so then, like, mm-hmm. you're missing a protein, and then you have some disease, right? That's sort of... Yeah. Kind of my mental yes. model. Is that even right? Yeah. There are, so, there are, like, a small number of... I guess initially it's like Mendel with the Ps, right? You learn about Mendel with the Ps in high school, and right, it's like, right. oh... Yeah, yeah. Depending on what the, what the sequence is, it's either going to be pink flowers or white flowers. Yeah. And I think people thought that was going to be the case for genes. <laughs> and there are a small number of genes, like sickle cell anemia is a great example of a mm-hmm. gene where we, you know, we know that this gene, if you have this variant, you're going to have sickle cell anemia. If you don't, you, know, you won't. But mm-hmm. most, most traits, whether it's height or autism or diabetes or whatever, are... Mm-hmm actually it's sort of it's sort of like uh there's a whole collection of thousands of genes that Mm -hmm. determine whether or not you're going to get a particular disease and how you know you have a distribution of genes that mean you're more or less likely to have a disease and then that distribution interacts with your environment and what you're exposed to Mm -hmm. so yeah it's more complicated than mendel so your your research is on the actual kind of physical mechanism that that goes from like you have this you have more of some kind of protein and then something happens. Is that right? I guess my, my, uh, like my research, (laughs) and again, it's like so technical. Okay. There's a few different things that I would say my research focuses on at a basic level. One of the questions that I'm interested in is when you have changes in the sequence of a protein or changes in the part of the genome that tell you when and how much to make of that protein, how do those changes alter function? So I guess, you know, I was initially, I was a physicist, my PhD is in physics. And one of the things Mm -hmm. that I think is really interesting is that these sequences code for molecules, three-dimensional molecules. And a change Mm -hmm. in the sequence of that molecule changes the physical forces that it uses to interact with other molecules. So that can affect, you know, whether a cell lives or dies, whether a fetus lives or dies. It's sort of this interaction Mm -hmm. at the scale where a change at the level of a molecule can have profound influences for a fetus or a cell. So my lab is really interested Mm -hmm. in how changes in in the sequence of a molecule affect Mm -hmm. its structure and function. I'm not sure if that's like specific. Enough. So the, the, the first, <laughs> no, totally. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can repeat this back. <laughs> so, yeah. so it sounds like you're interested in. So, like the DNA makes RNA, and there's probably some asterisk there. And then the RNA kind of makes a linear sequence of like a protein. Yeah. And it sounds like you're sort of interested in like how the changes in in the the composition, I guess, of that protein sort of change, like something that happens beyond that? Yeah. So DNA makes RNA makes protein. Proteins then fold into a three-dimensional structure and they do things in the cell. So sometimes they bind RNA to tell the cell when it should make other genes. They bind other proteins to transmit signals. Mm -hmm. They have all of, you know, proteins are kind of like the functional workhorse of like what makes stuff happen in your cells. And Mm -hmm. my lab is really interested in how do changes in those sequences alter the structure and function of the molecules? And I guess, you know, I would say sort of two more things. One of the Mm -hmm. things, you know, our approach is it's a problem of staggering complexity. 
right? The number of possible amino acid combinations for an average size protein is larger than the number of atoms in the universe. So we're never going to be able to mm-hmm. test all possible variants and see what they do. That's just impossible. So we're really interested in trying mm-hmm. to figure out, can we create libraries in which we systematically vary sequence, it varies these physical properties, mm-hmm. and we assess the effect on function so that we can kind of learn not just a black box relationship between sequence and function, but we can ultimately develop like quantitative and predictive models that would allow us to predict not mm-hmm. just for the molecules we study, but for all molecules, how sequence changes alter function. Mm-hmm. I see. But but through yeah. like kind of a physical understanding versus like, I feel like the, the machine learning perspective might be to sort of like, hey, let's treat this as a black box, possibly, and let's, let's sort of like look for patterns here versus trying exactly. to understand the actual like physics of what's happening. Exactly. And so what I what I think where I think that where I think that like us and and where we've really in, like loved collaborating with machine learning specialists is our approach is, you know, we develop these tools. We we make these devices called microfluidic devices that are kind of like, you know, you can sort of picture the way integrated circuits made it possible to do a lot of electronic computations in a very small footprint. And that kind of led to this revolution in computer science hardware. For us, what we do is we um, use these, we make these microfluidic devices that allow us to do like fluidic computations in high throughput, in very small footprints. So now what we can do is we can do- So wait, fluidic computation? Right, so you know, normally if you were gonna do an experiment in cell, in biology, you sort of picture like test tubes uh-huh. and like Petri dishes and like big things. Uh-huh. And if uh-huh. you wanted to do a thousand reactions, you need these giant expensive robots. And so what we've been doing is we've been using this approach where we can create these like tiny devices that instead of using like five milliliters of fluid for each reaction, we use about a nanoliter. And these devices make it possible to use, you know, fewer reagents. So everything is low cost. We can automate things on these devices without the use of expensive robots. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, the main power of of these technologies is that they they allow us to make a thousand measurements in the amount of time and cost that it used to take to make one in biology. And now I think that that means that we can generate data at a scale that allows us to quantitatively test predictions from our colleagues in ML, right? So, you know, you all need ground mm-hmm. truth. You need some ground truth measurement to assess what's going on. Mm-hmm. And you can't just have one or two. You need enough that you can, you know, do some sort of regression to figure out where is your model successful and where is it failing? And so, mm-hmm. you know, our job is to make measurements of like a thousand things really quantitatively where we can interface back and forth with ML people to test those predictions, revise and refine those models. And, you know, hopefully try and use some of these ML predictions to learn new physics. That's what, that's what we want to do. That's so cool. So like, what would be like, what would be something that would happen at that tiny scale? Like, what are you, are, what are you like, literally like putting like a protein in there and, and watching yeah. what happens? Like, yeah, I don't okay. know, can you, can you explain like exactly yeah. what goes yeah, into that? Yeah, exactly. So. So, okay, here's two examples of some platforms we've developed. So we've been working really closely with Dan Hirschlag, and he's like an enzymologist. And so one type of protein that we're interested in is enzymes. And enzymes are like they underpin all of our metabolism, right? They make it possible to do chemical reactions that would never happen in the absence of an enzyme. So they're really, they're important both for our cells. They're the tools people use in modern molecular biology. You use them to make libraries for sequencing. People use them in, you know, you use them when you do your laundry, right? Enzymes are the things that like bust up stains on your clothes. And we still don't really know how the sequence of an enzyme specifies its function. So one thing that we can do now is uh, just like sort of, I guess, you know, DNA, like the Moderna vaccine, right? Everybody sort of heard Now we can make this mRNA vaccine and we can program it to make something that we want. We can create little pieces of DNA, each of which specifies a protein we want to make. 
we can use a robot so that we spot bits of this DNA in an array. So we have like a thousand little spots and we know the program encoded by the DNA in each spot. We could take one of these devices that we make that has little chambers and align them to the spots. Mm -hmm. And then there's sort of this magical mixture of like all of the stuff that you need to turn DNA into RNA and protein. The companies sell. It's like you just buy this little tube that has, mm -hmm. you know, the polymerase you learned about in high school biology, the ribosome that makes the protein, all that stuff. We push it into these little chambers. And it fits in a nanoliter? Yeah. So the nanoliter is yeah. not too, it's, it all fits. Yeah, wow, nanoliter, okay. a nanoliter is like, okay, right. your hair, a hair strand is like 100 microns. Each of the chambers uh -huh. in these devices is about the diameter of your hair and, a, and the height of a tenth of your hair, right? So we use like a lot of the machinery that people use for lithography to make these integrated circuits. We use that same, all the same equipment to make these like tiny devices. And now we can make ah, okay. a little I guess bit, I see the yeah. integrated circuit analogy. Yeah. Exactly. So we do, it, it, the, we really do use a lot of the same equipment, except for now, instead of pushing electrons around, we're actually pushing fluid that contains molecules in different ways within these devices. So we can make each one of these enzyme variants in each chamber. And now we can quantitatively uh -huh. ask, when you make this mutation, how does it affect the ability of this enzyme to catalyze the reaction it's supposed to catalyze. So that's like sort of, that's an example of one of the things that we do. And it, um, and the reason why you would want to do it is this might help us classify variants in the human population for whether or not, or not they're likely to compromise function and cause disease. It could also maybe help us generate new enzymes that eat up environmental waste or design new enzymes to do things that we want to do. One other example, I guess, of something that we do is Historically, when you've looked at a population of cells, let's say from a tumor, we've ground up all those cells and we've asked, what's the behavior of that population of cells? Within all of those cells, maybe there's one or two rare cells that's resistant to a drug. And when we treat a patient with that drug, those one or two cells are going to proliferate and drive treatment failures, right? So we need a way where instead of like looking at all of the cells mashed up together, we want to be able to profile the cells one by one. So another way, another technology that we're using that this field microfluidics allows you to do is we can actually put every cell in a tiny droplet, like a little, basically a little water and oil uh, droplet that serves as a tiny compartment where we can interrogate that cell by itself without looking at all of its neighbors at the same time. And so again, those are little, those droplets are like a nanoliter, right? And we can look at a million cells individually at once in their own little nanoliter compartments. So how do you, how do you break up all the cells? Yeah, people, some cells just grow like blood cells grow by themselves. For solid cells, you know, this is something that actually our collaborators do. I never actually, I never really know how to do this, but you can treat them with enzymes that like chew up the stuff that connect them so that they separate, right? If they grow on a surface, you treat them with this enzyme and then they like separate from each other and come into the solution. And then we put them in the bubbles, in the droplets. Yeah. It's some automated way, I assume. Yeah, I have, I wish I could show you the videos. I could send you. I some know. Videos. I want to well, send me some videos. Yeah, we'll we'll put some links to them. That would, I'll send awesome. you some. I'll send um, you videos of both. Yeah. Cool. I, I so I guess like I mean I guess it's funny like a really dumb question that I I keep being kind of afraid to ask, but I think other people might be feeling is like you know everyone sort of saw in machine learning the the protein folding thing and kind of everybody knows that like protein folding is like this interesting you know big problem that a lot of you know a lot of ML people have worked on, but I've always kind of. I guess, you know, why, I guess here I'll ask the question, why is protein folding so important? Like, it seems like it would be really critical to your work, mm -hmm. but can't you also just like look at the proteins and see what shape they have? Like, aren't, aren't they literally 
It's such there. a good question. These questions are awesome. Yeah, so they're tiny, right? They're really tiny. And so to see the structure of a protein, you have a few options. Historically, people have, have done like, have tried to crystallize them. So they've tried to get them to basically form a three-dimensional crystal where they're all in the same shape. And then uh -huh. they've taken them to a giant X-ray beam, right? Like the Stanford Linear Accelerator or other places like this. They've shot X-rays through uh -huh. them. They've looked at the diffraction pattern that they make. And then they apply a bunch of like, you know, kind of super fancy Fourier transforms essentially to take the diffraction pattern and, and turn it back into a picture of what the protein looks like in 3D. It's really hard, right? You go to talks all the time where a graduate student is like, I spent five years trying to crystallize this one protein, right? A lot of proteins don't crystallize and it's it's slow. And the other thing is most proteins uh -huh. don't exist as like a single static structure. They're like wiggling around all the time. And that wiggling is really important for uh -huh. their job, for how they do their function. More recently, people have started using you know, like cryoelectron microscopy is another way to kind of look at proteins where you like freeze proteins down on these metal grids. And then you use these super fancy like $10 million microscopes to look at the individual particles. And there's been a real revolution in this in the last several years, basically because of the image processing algorithms have made it possible to, you know, align many different particles and kind of reconstruct what things look like. But that's only suitable for big proteins. You can't really do it for small proteins. So the vast majority of proteins don't have crystal structures or these cryoEM structures. So we just don't know what they look like. And we've, we've really looked at some of them fold into these three-dimensional structures. A lot of them are kind of unfolded. And we don't even, we've never, we haven't, we have very few pictures of what they're doing. So trying to predict the, the number of structures we have is just tiny compared to the number of proteins we know about. And the structures are oh. often a static picture. So that's one reason, it, that's one reason why it's a hard problem. And the reason why you want to know is let's say you want to design a new drug to target a protein. You kind of know, need to know that 3D shape mm -hmm. so you can figure out like, where would you put a drug <laughs> and what kind of drug is likely to fit in there and alter the function of that protein? Maybe. I'm not sure if that. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I guess there was this incredibly, no, I don't know. I saw this, that, that was really helpful. Thank you. And I, I saw this amazing blog post that I think was from more of a computer science perspective on how the Moderna drug worked, which is super helpful for me to understand, like, why you would kind of care about. Well, no, that's my and mental Drew model Ford, now. I think like, Drew, like, Ford, Drew forwarded that to me. Yeah. Oh, cool. Drew, that's, yeah. I, I was like, wow, this is so amazing that people could figure this stuff out and then, like, make a certain shape. And then it seemed like they modified it a little bit from the natural one yeah. to kind of make the shape better. And I, it's like... I can't believe they figured that they figured that out, but it sounds like they figured it out in like days. So I, I is that kind of yeah. Like so so that's a, yeah. It, no, it was, what was really interesting was yeah. Drew was like the people who figured this out should get some huge prize. Uh, <laughs> and I think what's what's really interesting is that you know it's been like tens of thousands of people over decades who have made it possible, right? So I think for this particular vaccine. There are, there are people that sort of specialized in mRNA vaccine production that have been critical. There's people that specialize in coronavirus, you know, coronavirus in general and, and spike protein, which is like, you know, the protein on the surface that we're trying to mimic with these vaccines. But it's mm -hmm. really kind of a beautiful example of so many different fields of biology have contributed to that, you know, in terms of thinking about like the, the folding and the structure of RNA to, to figure out, I mean, both in terms of immunology, what parts of the protein should we be targeting in terms of thinking about nucleic acid biology? How do we make an mRNA that's going to be pretty stable, right? Which some of the modifications that you're talking about made it more stable. Thinking about delivery, how do we wrap it 
so that it can go into your body and isn't just instantly chewed up by all of the enzymes in your body that are looking for foreign invaders and want to chew them up all the time. So it's really, it's an amazing triumph of the scientific community and scientists from so many different fields. Yeah. It's really exciting, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it seems cool. Yeah. So I guess, I guess I'm kind of curious your experience collaborating with, you know, kind of with, with machine learning practitioners. Like, can, can you, Maybe describe like what what that's been like and what I, I I mean I remember when I first started working with you know people in in medicine uh, with my last company it was such a funny kind of cultural mismatch where they, I remember them telling me they, they were doing like microscopy and they were like we have so much data you know we have like five hundred people's you know like tumors that that have been sliced and stained or something and I was just like wait a minute that's Tiny. I'm not sure like yeah, any like- <laughs> would work with that like I, you know. Yeah, like they're they're big files, I guess. But like, I think I need more than a big file. Yeah, I mean, I I love it. I think it's so pleasurable. I, yeah, yeah, I love working with with practitioners of machine learning, both because as a field, it's moving so fast, right? So the things that are possible this year are different than what was possible six months ago, a year ago. It's interesting to think about all of the ways in which algorithms that are developed for, you know, figuring out whose face is in a photo can instantly be ported, be ported to biology, right? So you can leverage all of the commercial interest in developing something like that towards problems like what we study that are never going to be as commercially viable or interesting, right? So that's really exciting. In terms of the culture mismatch, you know, what's funny, I think, is I'm on, you know, thesis committees for a lot of ML students now. And for ML students, Mm -hmm. what they want is they want their algorithm to have like the best AUC by 2%, you know, even a small, an incremental benefit is good, right? Because it could potentially scale. But for them, any points that are unexplained are like a failure. Whereas for us, that's the most interesting mm-hmm. part, right? What 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 do those points that are not explained by the algorithm have in common? And are we discovering new biology or new physics that uh, we hadn't thought about before? So, and and it's mm-hmm. cool in that you know trying like the mathematical facility that ML practitioners have is astounding and so it's 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 fun where some of the questions you know people are like i'm sorry just what is a protein where we're like oh okay yeah we can answer that and then at the same time i'm like you know try i'm looking at that image everybody shows of their neural net with like the you know all the layers and i have no idea how that would how you would actually implement that. Like I've seen the picture. I have the picture in my papers, right? <laughs> right <laughs> but right. I would never be able to actually do, I don't even know the first thing about how to set it up, you know? Yeah. So I, I think that's what's, I think that's what's sort of fun about it is that there's this natural complementarity, but there's so much for each side to learn that it's, it's always really intellectually engaging. Do you feel like um, coming from, like kind of a physics background, is it maybe like disappointing that, I mean, do you, do you worry at all that, that maybe the only way to explain some of these systems is through kind of a black box, you know, technique? Like, I, I feel like the, the protein folding thing, like, it seems like for a long time, I knew that people were, it seemed like they were really trying to like, just simulate what would happen to the proteins. And it, I'm not totally up on the latest stuff, but it seemed to me like the, 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 the approach that worked really well with the alpha fold was sort of less physics simulation and more just kind of like mm-hmm. observing. I, I guess is where do you think that goes? So for me, what I really think about is, and this is you know sort of the heart of some of the stuff that we've been doing with Anshul Kandaji's lab, uh-huh. is what I think is so. What here's my motivation for why I think we need to eventually know the physical principles. You know, let's say we were wanting to learn how to like create a new ballistic or like fly a new thing. If we just wanted to take this black box approach, it would be like, okay, each time we want to fly a new thing or make a new ballistic, we're just going to make a thousand ballistics and then we're going to shoot them and we're going to collect the data and then we'll train a neural, we'll hold out some of the data and we'll train a neural net. And now we're going to be able to predict it for that system. 
the ability, you know, the fact that we know the laws of gravity means that we're not restricted to just now working with that system that we've tested a thousand times. We can work with all kinds of systems because we have this generalizable physical model. I don't think it's necessarily at odds with machine learning approaches. So, you know, one thing that we think is really exciting is let's say you're able to, to train a neural net on a given data set where you have a physical hypothesis mm -hmm. about what's going on. We can do a lot of experiments. We can do a thousand experiments, a thousand measurements in parallel each time we run an assay, but that's often not enough mm -hmm. to fully characterize a system. If you have a neural net that can predict behaviors, now we can feed it in things where we're systematically varying particular physical parameters to ask what it thinks, right? So I think sometimes you can use these black box models as a way to do in silico experiments at a scale far beyond what you could reach with even the in highest silica. throughput Right? Like you can. So in silico experiments, you know, you can do millions or billions of silico, in silico experiments, choose a thousand that you then go back and test with some of our experimental techniques to see what's going on. So I think, you know, I think rather than just thinking of neural network predictions as an endpoint, like I'm going to train on this system and I'm going to predict for this system. Can we use them as a tool to uncover generalizable physical principles? To me, that's like a really mm -hmm. interesting and complementary way to think about those problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Another question, and I guess I'm just asking kind of the dumb questions that maybe I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid to ask other people. But Do you it. know, when, when I look at like image recognition, and and you know, I I feel like I've been working on image recognition for two decades, so I've sort of seen it go from totally not working to to working maybe better than humans in a, in a lot of, you know, controlled mm -hmm. cases. Yeah, partic particularly in like clinical cases, right? There's a lot of clinical evidence that it can work better than Yeah, people. yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you, know, you talked about how it's like, you know, mostly, you know, trained off of, you know, images online, like really ImageNet was kind of this moment where mm -hmm. it started working where, you know, people decided to collect a huge set of data and then there was this thing called transfer learning where that's kind of become mainstream, right? Where people take, you know, something trained on a big set of data and then they, they kind of fine tune it on the smaller mm -hmm. set of data. Do you feel like that is working in, in biology? Like, is there an analogy to that where there's some like big data set that you could train on and then, you know, kind of modify the, the models to work on smaller data sets? It, it's, it just yeah, seems so clear that that's what happened in, in images. And I, I don't really know the, the, the biology analogies to that. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think that's definitely, when I go to talks right now, everybody's always using transfer learning. It's because the, of the fact that it's hard to make measurements, right? So maybe you have one system and you've characterized it to death and now you want to know the other system. The ability to train on the system that you've really characterized well and then predict in a different system, that's hugely valuable. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's hugely valuable. And I think is seeing applications all the time in biology. Like maybe people have characterized one cell type really, really well. Now there's another cell type, but it costs so much money to characterize mm -hmm. a cell type at that depth that now if they can use transfer learning to predict behavior for this novel cell type that hasn't been as well characterized, that's super valuable. Well, it seems like maybe one difference is that, you know, there's a lot of commercial interest in, well, I guess there's a lot of commercial interest in biology too, but it's maybe it's cheaper to classify images. Like it was interesting that, you know, like one very motivated professor, you know, Feifei at Stanford, right, could, could make this, you know, amazing data set that kind of changed the whole field. And I sort of imagine that the same type of thing in biology would be expensive enough to make it complicated and hard. And, and maybe no one's really motivated to, to do this as a general works project. I mean, that, I guess, you know, another thing is the ability to crowdsource measurements, yeah, right, right. right? So, totally. you know, people are generating images all day long and uploading mm -hmm. them and, and making them publicly available. I think the closest you come to that would be sequencing, right? People are sequencing and, and people are willingly sharing all of their genomic data with 23andMe and Ancestry.com and all of these places. So that has sort of seen crowdsourced growth and it's still not on the scale of images, but 
a huge amount of data. But I think, yeah, I think what's really lacking is we're getting more and more sequences and that's great. But in the same way that for the images, you not only needed the images, but you needed initially to know, is this a dog or a cat or an arm or a barbell or like, what is this? Mm -hmm. That's what I think we don't have as much in biology right now. We have all the sequence, but we don't really know. We don't have the functional annotation that goes with it that allows us Mm -hmm. to make that same sort of progress. And I think that's, to me, that's the bottleneck, right? That's the thing that we're trying to solve. Yeah, it's, I actually didn't really realize what your work was on. It's, it's so cool that you're, you're, I mean, it seems like actually collecting data at a far bigger scale would be like the perfect thing to make, you know, the, the mathematical models work, work better. So it seems pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, I've, I've been like, I've been obsessed with, um, Marcus Covert told me about this book, The Weather Makers, that he said was really great. And so I read it. And he, he, we both took different things away from it. But part of the book is sort of talking about, you know, a hundred years ago, people had these kind of primitive atmospheric models where you could have a room full of people all doing calculations in parallel. And at the end of, you know, they, they would start calculating. And at the end of 24 hours, they had the ability to predict what the weather was going to be 24 hours in the future. So it was like, all of these people calculating could basically just keep pace with time and it didn't really give you any predictive power. Now, you know, we have these these weather models that allow, you know, you can look 10 days out and have a pretty good sense of if it's going to rain, if it's going to snow, you know, what's going to happen with the weather. What Marcus took away from it is that you really need to look at an entire system, so like a cell, in its entirety in order to really be able to model and understand the behavior. What I took away from it was this progress was really only enabled by the fact that we had weather stations around the world that were recording huge amounts of data, not in relative terms, like, oh, it's 10% hotter today than it was yesterday, or it's going to rain twice as much today as yesterday. But they were recording all of these data in terms of physical constants like temperature and uh, you know precipitation humidity. And that allowed us to develop these atmospheric models and to, to, to test the predictions of physical models and to develop this predictive power. So you know, my, our big push using these technologies, using these microfluidic technologies that make it possible to shrink biology and make measurements at a much more rapid pace, we're really interested in trying to say, can we do this for biological systems, but can we also always do it in the language of physical constants, right? There's there's quantities like energies that reflect how much energy it takes to fold something and what the energy is when two different molecules come together. And so those are the kinds of quantities we're trying to measure. And I think that ultimately those types of measurements in concert with huge amounts of sequence data and ML algorithms that are seeking to predict the function of different sequences and how changes to those sequences alter function, those kinds of physical constants can be can be integrated with all of that other stuff to eventually attack these problems that seem intractable now, but so did weather prediction 24 years, 20 or a hundred years ago. So I guess I feel like scientists always hate to answer this question, but I'm sure like everybody's thinking it when you use that analogy, like when you roll this kind of work forward, you know, 10 or 20 years or more, like what, how, how would it affect like my, like my day-to-day life? Like, is it like mm-hmm. a lot of diseases get cured or I mean, what, 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 what was, what is like the ultimate like impact of this stuff? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of our science is pretty basic to be, you know, to be like unashamed about it. So, you know, a defense of that is, CRISPR has been this amazing tool and it came from, you know, people studying the mechanisms of bacterial immunity, right? Nobody was looking for things that were necessarily going to transform our ability to engineer genomes, but that's what we found in the course of doing basic scientific research. For me, what would be tangible things that I would hope could come out of some of our research are, I hope that we can 
characterize functional variants across some of these proteins so that clinicians can tell their patients, this mutation that you have, like the measurements we make could improve the algorithms that would allow a clinician to say to a patient, you have this mutation, and I think it means that we should treat you with this drug. So sort of closing the loop on precision medicine beyond the most common variants to more rare variants that people have to provide clinically actionable information. For precision medicine, you know, some of the, the things that we're doing where we're looking at these individual cells, you know, we have these droplet platforms as well as some other platforms. I'd like those to become something where we could work with actual clinical samples to say, we looked at the cells from your tumor and we're able to say that a small fraction of them carry this, this particular resistance marker, or we tested the drug sensitivity profile of the cells from your tumor. And so we're recommending this course of action. And then beyond medicine, I think the ability to say, you know, we've got to, to design enzymes with particular functions, right? The ability to say, okay, we've got this toxic chemical that has leaked out of this mine. How are we going to clean it up? You know, what if in the same way that, you know, you can write a program to do certain things, what if we could now specify the DNA that makes the protein that would have the capability of breaking down that compound to be non-toxic? To me, those are all the dreams of, those are the three dreams of the research we're doing. And then I would say the last thing is, you know, as a faculty at a university, my biggest impact will probably not even come from my own work, but I'm training all of these incredibly talented graduate students and postdocs. And so if one of them acquires the skills that allows them to go off and solve some of these problems or run things, you know, then then your function is fulfilled, right? So you're not only trying to do research and, and take grant money that the public gave you reluctantly and turn it into papers and knowledge, you're also trying to be a mentor that allows people to come through your lab to gain the skills that they need to be successful in the future in industry or in research or as public communicators or whatever they decide to do. Wow, I wish I could go back to grad school and work in the, the Fortis lab. That sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> there, you know, I love my lab. My lab is amazing. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. Um, I guess one, one final question, because I know we have so many kind of students that, that watch this. If, if you were kind of starting your career, or I guess what, how would you guide like an ML-oriented person like early in their career who's really interested in the biological applications like what where, where would you guide them to kind of look mm -hmm. for having a successful you know career for the next few decades uh are they i guess are they are they gonna are they going to school or are they not going to school going to school like yeah i guess so i would encourage you know i think if they i think for i think kind of the most to me the people that have the most impact and a lot of the my collaborators my ml collaborators that i'm most like always in awe of, I think what they're able to do is not only are they incredibly proficient at developing novel al algorithms, I think that's hard, but there's a lot of people that are good at that, right? That's very competitive to be like the absolute best at just straight up algorithm development. I think the ones that really try and engage with the biology, so ask all the stupid questions, starting with the very first thing that they don't understand, right? Mm -hmm. Ask questions all the time, try and get references about the biology literature or the physics literature, right? I, I really think that there's so many things in common between like machine learning and the way in which it works and like statistical mechanics and thermodynamics and mm -hmm. just the mathematical frameworks of both are, are really very similar. I think becoming conversant in both of those really positions you where I think it's easier to leverage these really powerful algorithms you're developing to make the most progress in the field that you're trying to attack. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That makes total sense. And the stupid question thing, I really mean it. I mean, when I transitioned, when I started my postdoc, I had been trained in physics and I didn't any, I asked questions where 
my advisor literally put his head in his hands because he couldn't <laughs> believe that anybody didn't know this. Like the students that were training me would be like, can you go run this on a gel? And I was like, no, because I do not know how to run gels with just something that every biologist knows, right? Uh, <laughs> And it was painful. Like I cried that first six months because I felt so stupid all the time. But I think being willing to ask those incredibly stupid questions over and over and over again, it, it makes that learning curve steep. It's painful, but it makes the learning curve steep. And I think, yeah, I think it's the thing to do. Awesome. Well, thanks for answering my stupid questions. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> they weren't stupid at all. They were really good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening to another episode of Gradient Descent. Doing these interviews are a lot of fun, and it's especially fun for me when I can actually hear from the people that are listening to these episodes. So if you wouldn't mind leaving a comment and telling me what you think or starting a conversation, that would make me inspired to do more of these episodes. And also, if you wouldn't mind liking and subscribing, I'd appreciate that a lot.